We're going to get into it. I do feel like God has spoken to me about this message, so hopefully he will speak to you through this as well. We have had some great messages over the past uh, six weeks or so. We've been talking about faith practices, and this is our scripture that we've been focusing on. Hello? Hello? David? Is it working? There it is. 1 Peter 3, 8 to 9. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your word. Thank you that it speaks to us today, it speaks to us in our, in our moment of need with you, Lord. And I just pray that you um, bless our fellowship today, bless the words that I speak, let them be a word in season, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, who can remember the words that we've found, um, the messages that we've had over the past few weeks? It was Emily's last week, not last week, the week before, sorry, Humble Heart, which was excellent. One mind, one heart, be tender-hearted. Who remembers the word? You splachnos. You splachnos. That was was compassion in our bowels. That's what that... That was a good word from Benito. Speech of the heart. So there's a bit of a theme here around the heart, which I'm not going to be speaking on today. I'm going to break tradition. But I'm going to speak about love one another. And I'll just read this again. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Now, love one another comes from the Greek word, which you probably can't see, Philadelphos, Philadelphos, two, comes from two words, Phila and Adelphos. And I want to briefly explain Adelphos first. Adelphos means brother or member of the same family or religious community, especially f- followers or Christians. I think I've written that wrong up there. A, f- follow, a follower of Christ or a fellow Christian. Is that right? Yeah, that's good. Fellow Christians. So you might have heard the term Philadelphia, the um, place in America, which is the city of, of brotherly love. Okay, that's what this word means, brotherly love. Adelphos, a member of the same family or religious community, but especially fellow Christians, those of us who have common beliefs. The second word is the one that I really want us to focus on, which is philos. Now, philos is a friend someone dearly loved or prized in a personal, intimate way. It's a trusted confidant held dear in a close bond of personal affection. And the root phil conveys experiential, personal affection indicating that philos expresses experience-based love. Experience-based love. This is a Deep friendship between two people based on affection and trust, drawn together by common beliefs. Now, obviously, in this context, we're talking about Christians, we're talking to Christians, but really, this can happen in other contexts too, where people come together with common beliefs. It's very common amongst those who served in the, in the army or served in war together. They talk about brotherhood. People that come from completely different backgrounds who are in the same scenario, having these shared experiences together, which forms this bond that can't be broken, no matter what. It's not the kind of love or it's not the kind of relationship that you have with everybody. It would be impossible to actually have this kind of relationship, this kind of love with everybody in your life. This is deep. 
I see, hope you don't mind me pointing out, but I see these amazing women in the front row grabbing each other's hands because I'm sure you, this resonates with you. And it, it's amazing. It, it is what we need as Christians. You cannot live your life. Or you can. But you, you, you can't live your life to the fullest without having people in your life who love you and care for you who have been through experiences with you, who have been there through thick and thin, who have watched you laugh and have watched you cry, who have told you to pull your head out sometimes or have said nothing at all other than just sit there and just listen and listen and listen. That is philos love. It's obvious to everyone around you. Just like this as an example, it's obvious And I want to show you an example of where Jesus expressed this in the Bible. In John 11, 33 to 36, this is the story of when Lazarus died. And before this, before this part, Martha had run out to Jesus and Jesus was on his way and she was a bit upset with him that he was late, that Lazarus had already passed away. And so he continues on and then Mary comes out to see him and Mary's very emotional and, and that's where um, Mary says to him as well, you, you know, it's, it's too late, he's already passed away. If he had only been here four days ago, he would still be alive. And Jesus said, sorry, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. And they say this is the shortest verse, or one of the shortest verses in the Bible. But Jesus wept. And I don't think he just had a tear streaming out of his eye. I think... That when it says that Jesus wept, I think Jesus wept out of a deep emotional grieving for Lazarus and for the people that were there that were also grieving. Emily said rightly, Jesus was fully God and fully human. And I think sometimes we overemphasize his fully Godness and forget about the fact that he was also fully human. And when he wept, he wept like any of us weep when someone close to us, someone who we love dearly, dies. It's not not just a passing moment. This is a deep feeling of grief that Jesus shared with these people. And I'm sure he knew that he would be able to raise Lazarus from the dead. Or maybe he didn't. Maybe he was just trusting that God would do that. But what's important is the next line where it says, Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. That word loved is philos. See how he philos him. They recognized that this love that Jesus had for him was born out of a close and deep relationship. Now, if you remember the story of Mary and Martha, very famous, everyone remembers it. I think Martha gets a bad rap in it because Martha's off, you know, getting everything ready and Mary, you know, sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha's like, oh gosh, I'm doing everything here. She's just moping around, sitting at your feet. In the context, Lazarus would have been in that room too. If Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus while he spoke, the other people around him Lazarus, being the brother of Mary and Martha, would have been in that room, no doubt, sitting there also listening to Jesus. They had a close bond, not just like people you see at church every Sunday who you say hello to and you want the best of them, but they shared life together. You know, I believe that that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, not out of obligation, not out of a sign of 
necessarily the miracle that God could do. I honestly believe that he raised Lazarus from the dead out of a deep love for him, out of a deep relationship. And of course, it's an example of God's grace and God's love. And he raised others from the dead. He raised the girl from the dead. But he did not weep when he raised her from the dead. Did he? He didn't weep. Philos, love, is always a consequence of the experience and bond that we share together, not out of obligation or obedience. Are you with me? It's beautiful. It's messy. It's funny. But it's always, always as a consequence of the bond that we share with some other person. Which brings me to the next, love one another. The next, love one another. The next one, (laughs) which is in John 13, 34 to 35. Thank you, David. I don't know what's going on with this thing, but... It's not this. All right. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, this love is a different word for love, which I'm sure you've heard in this church before, the Greek word. Anyone want to have a stab at it? Did everyone say agape? You're wrong. It's next slide. Is this working or? I was just It is the same word. But this agapeo, agapeo. But it comes from the same word as agape. We all know agape, so let's call it that. The, the meaning of agape, to love means actively doing what the Lord prefers with him by his power and direction. True agape, or loving, the act of loving, is always defined by God, a discriminating affection which involves choice and selection. Philos is very different to agape. Philos is the kind of love that we show for one another out of pure love, out of relationship, out of the the overflowing of connection that we have with another person. Agape love is an action. It's the action we choose based on our love for God, not our love for other people. In other words, another way to describe agape would be obedient. Our obedience to the word of God in doing what he has instructed us, and all of these scriptures are an instruction, is an act of agape to to do for others what God has called us to do out of love for him is agape. And I stress the act of doing it out of our love for God, not necessarily our love for other people, but our love for God, is the difference between agape and works. And obedience to God out of love for God is agape. Doing nice things for other people just because is works. And I'm not saying they're bad. I just want to stress the difference that we can do nice things for other people and that's fine. But agape love is about obedience to doing what God has either called us to do or already told us what to do through his word. Does that make sense? Matthew 5, 43 to 48, and this is in the NLT version. You've heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. 
In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that. If you are kind only to your friends, who are you different from? How are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And that word perfect, I didn't put it up there, but I don't want to focus on it too much. It's the Greek word teleos. It's, <laughs> it just means to come to completion, to be made complete and whole. It's a, it's a, a journey. We can't just be perfect, but we are to be perfect to continue to try through actions and obedience to be perfect, just as even our Father in heaven is perfect. And there is one perfect example of agape love that we can all learn from, and that is in John 15, 9 to 13. And this is Jesus speaking. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay his life down to lay down one's life for one's friends. Jesus showed his love for us by laying his life down for us so that we could be in relationship with God, so that our sins could be atoned for, so that we can, as Julie said in worship, around experiencing the end, the glory of God. I can't remember the exact words he said, but I can't wait for the, the end. That was Jesus' agape example to us, that he laid his life down for us. And again, I want to stress the human aspect of Jesus. If you remember the story, the night before the crucifixion, Jesus prayed to God. And he sweat blood. And that there, there, are, there are actual records of people who have had this. It comes from, a, from, from sweating blood, comes from a deep stress and anguish where your, the capillaries under your skin burst through stress and the, the sweat comes through your pores. Uh, sorry, the blood comes through with your sweat through your pores. So it actually happens. It's, it, it is something that all of us, and God willing, none of us have to um, ever have, but it has happened to other people. So Jesus, under great stress and anguish, was under so much stress that he actually sweat blood and prayed that God would take this cup from him. Take it, please, God, take this cup from me. But what does he say? Not your will, not my will, but yours. If it is your will, then so be it. And he was obedient to God for us. Now, the interesting thing about agape is that the response of the person who we're showing agape to is actually irrelevant. We don't show agape for gratitude or for thanks. And quite often, I'm sure all of you have experienced this, you do something nice for people and you don't get the response that you want or that you're expecting. And you say, oh, well, thank you would be nice. And that's, that's okay, that's a human reaction. But agape is based on our action for them out of our love for God, not their response to us. And so when Jesus, showing the ultimate act of agape, took his took himself to the cross and lost his life for our sake, for all, as John 3.16 says, so that all, all and any 
can have a relationship with God knowing full well that not all people were going to accept him as their saviour. He knew that not everybody was going to appreciate that. And in fact, people persecuted him. There were people, the people that persecuted him, he died for them just as he died for us. That is the perfect act of agape. And as much as we don't necessarily always like to talk about this word, really the key to showing agape love is obedience. And I think sometimes we, we can over-spiritualise it and we ask for God to speak to us, whether it's in the shower or in prayer or when we're driving our car or when we're walking into church, whatever the case may be. And I think most of us would say, if God speaks to me, I will be obedient. And I believe that. I believe that all, if not most of us, if we felt like God was speaking to us about showing someone love, we would probably do it. And I think that's amazing. But I think also sometimes what we miss is that God has given us his word. And it's written in black and white. And we don't have to wait for God to give us this amazing word, a verbal, audible word that we hear within us, that he is a written word that is a guide for us. Who, who remembers the acronym for the Bible? Basic instruction before leaving earth. You know, when, whenever there are instructions, the opposite of an instruction is to what? Is to be obedient. Someone gives an instruction, you know, if you're in the army, if, you're, if your commanding officer tells you to do something, you do it. You don't ask them for proof of why they're asking you to do that. You don't ask for context. You don't ask you know, any questions around how your action might end up in the, in, you know, in the end. You, they just blindly do it. And so when we look at 1 Peter 3 to 8 and 9, it says, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Don't repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. We are called to love one another, to philos, to philadelphos, which is brotherly love, but to love each other in deep, close, personal relationship. But we're also called to love each other through agape, which is the act of serving God to show his love to other people regardless of how they might receive that. I want to give you a brief example. I'm sure lots of you have got different examples like this. I used to play golf every Saturday in North Adelaide. I loved it. You know, it's a beautiful golf course. And at North Adelaide, there are these amazing historic trees, Moreton Bay fig trees. They're, They're huge, really big roots. They're beautiful. There's a few of them around the, around the golf course. And one of them in particular has these really low kind of hanging branches. And um, I knew what it looked like under there because I would hit my ball in there quite often. But, um, <laughs> but it was kind of like a sheltered area. So quite often there would be homeless people sleeping under the tree in between the tree roots. Now, I remember specifically there was this one man who... They used to just be there and then they wouldn't, you know, it was quite transient, you know, they're there one week and not there again. But there happened to be this one man who had really set up under this tree and was there two weeks in a row. And I remember the people that I was playing golf with, and this, this is not a judgment on them, but they would complain about this homeless person being on their golf course and, you know, being really judgmental and, you know, this is an older gentleman as well. And it was, it was cold. It was winter. And I felt compassion for this man because he was homeless, sleeping under a tree. And here I was playing golf with these other people, living, to be quite honest, a pretty privileged life. And so I felt to take him some food. And so I made a couple of sandwiches, 
took some fruit and a bottle of water, packed it in my golf bag. And when we got to that hole, I would almost go over to where the tree was and almost ashamedly take out the food that I had given, I had packed for this man and try and hide it from the people that I was playing with to drop it at the feet of this guy, hoping that he wouldn't wake up so that I could just leave him some food. And the, the point for me, there's, I know there's a lot in that. We should never be ashamed of showing God's love. And I, I reflect on that quite often and think about the message that I was probably giving to these other people, that, that what I was doing in some way was wrong. You know, by trying to hide it and being a little bit ashamed of it, it was somehow wrong of me to be showing agape to someone else who was in need. Now, that's one thing. The, the second thing is, and I'm being quite open and vulnerable with you about this, I wanted to give this guy food but I didn't really want to have a conversation with him. I didn't want to have to talk to him. I didn't want to spend time getting to know him or, you know, I didn't want him to get up and I didn't want to hear his story. I didn't, I didn't want, I also didn't want him to feel ashamed of me giving him food. I was very conscious that he might feel embarrassed that I was giving him food. But when you strip it all down, and again, I'm not, I'm not saying this to make myself sound better. All of the other stuff actually means nothing at all. What other people thought, what I was worried about, what they thought, what he was going to think, none of that, none of that was important. But what was important was that I genuinely felt God tell me to take him some food. And I did it out of obedience, not because, in honesty, not because I had this deep love of this man who I'd never met. But I felt God asking me to do something, and I wanted to be obedient to that. And I did. He was there for five or six weeks only. And from that first time, every week, I just kept bringing food and bringing food, you know, leaving it at his feet. You know, and sometimes he was awake and he would say thank you and, you know, it was great. But what we don't know is, I don't know what his relationship with God is like. I don't know if he was praying every night to God that someone would drop food at his feet. I don't know if he was praying for a home. I don't know if he didn't believe in God at all. Who knows? But I didn't do it for him to say thank you to me. I did it because God asked me to do it. And God asks us to do a lot of things in the Bible. Some of them he, he speaks to us about, others he's written about, so that we can learn and we can try and show his love. It says that this is how others will know that we are his disciples, by the love that we show for one another, the agape love that we show for one another. So I just want to wrap up and talk about the two different loves. Philadelphos is personal, it's affectionate, it's trusting. For us, it's about a common belief in God and it's out of love for another person. Now, society tells us to be self-sufficient. You know, relationships, deep relationships like this are on the outer we don't, we don't spend enough time with people anymore to be able to build this relationship. Men, we are especially bad at philos love because even if we do spend a lot of time with each other, hey, mate, how are you going? Good. How are you? Good. How about them crows? <laughs> right? Well, don't get me wrong, I, I, women do this too, this is not about gender, you know, but I think men are particularly not great at just, when someone says, how are you, you're saying, actually, I'm not that great. I'm not that great. I'm stressed to my eyeballs because I've got bills to pay and I don't know how I'm going to pay them and I want to change my life but I don't know how to change and I don't even know where to start. 
And I'm sick of going round and round and round this same cycle all the time. And I want something different and something new and something fresh in my life. I want more. I want to break this cycle. I want more of God. But I don't know how. I'm not going to ask for any response, but I know a lot, a lot of us, men and women, can relate to that. But we say, yeah, we're good, you know. And then someone says, no, how are you really? Yeah, you know, things could be better, but I'm, I'm good, you know. We, we do it. And I would like to pose the thought to you that allowing somebody to share your burden is actually agape love. If you offload, for lack of a better term, if you offload your cares and your worries and your burdens on someone else who has taken the time to ask you the question, within reason, of course, not the person you met at the bus stop, but if someone has taken the time to say, no, no, how are you, and you tell them the truth, that's agape love. Because you're giving them the opportunity to be able to show you philos love. And through that, you build a philos love relationship. It has to start somewhere. And I would suggest that that place to start is with obedience in agape love, in doing what God would call us to do, which is to love one another. And agape love is about obedience. It's about sacrifice. It's action-based. It is an example of God's love, and it's out of love for God, not for other people. I'm not saying that you can't love other people, of course. But the heart of agape love is obedience to God's word and wanting to serve him. And through that will come blessing. I can tell you from first-hand experience, I've, I have actually shared many times from here, you know, the, the difficult journey I've been on over the last couple of years. I don't know where I would be. I don't know. I certainly am confident that I would not be here speaking to you right now but I don't know where I would be if I didn't take the chance to be honest about where I was at with, with people that I had already established a philos relationship with. If it wasn't for the fact that I had the opportunity to speak, that I had someone in my life who said, I know you're saying you're okay, but I can tell you're not okay. So I'm going to keep asking you until you tell me Because they love me, I would not be in the state of mind or the state of life that I am in today without being obedient and trusting and giving someone the opportunity to love me back. I want to encourage us as a faith practice to have faith in God that he has put people in our life to love us and support us, to carry our burdens. Even Jesus, when he was being crucified and walking to his own death, carrying his cross, even in that moment, God brings someone to carry that cross for him. Simon of Cyrene, not a Christian, not a follower of Jesus. But somebody comes along and picks up his cross to carry it to the top of that hill so that Jesus can be crucified on it for us. We need each other. Love one another. That is the command that Jesus has given us. Philos each other. Not feel each other. Philos. Love and agape. Love. Very different but ultimately brings us to the same thing. And that is into a deeper relationship with God. Because the one thing I have experienced for sure 
is that my relationship with God has been strengthened far and far, far, far beyond what I could have ever experienced without being vulnerable and trusting him that I can love other people, that I can let other people love me. We need each other. And the world will tell you that you don't need anyone else. You can do it on your own. But that is a lie. We need each other. And I want to encourage you, if you don't have someone who you can think of, and it doesn't have to be 15 people, it can just be one person. If you don't have that one person in your life that you could pick up the phone today and verbally vomit every thought that you've got in your head and they will sit and listen and tell you that you're okay and that they love you and they'll ask you, is there anything I can do for you? They'll be at your door at the drop of a hat, whatever you need, whenever you need it, whatever you're thinking, who you never ever feel judged by, who you never feel like you're a burden to, those people or that one person in your life who can hold the the cross for you, who can hold a torch for you when things are dark. If you don't have that, then you need to find it. Because God is at the centre of that relationship. And it takes time. I know lots of us have been hurt in life. It takes trust. It takes risk. But let me tell you, a faith practice for all of us is to be vulnerable in relationship. I don't know if this was in a movie, but to give love an opportunity. To risk it all, no matter what, knowing that this is what God wants for us in our life. I just want to pray. I'm not going to ask you to to respond, but I'm sure that there are people here who... who might need some more philos love in their life. So if that's you, I just encourage you to pray that God will bring that person or those people into your life. And if they're already a part of your life, that God will just illuminate them to you, that you take a risk. So Father, we just thank you for your love. We thank you for your agape love. And we thank you for your example of philos love. We pray, Lord, that, that all of us, that all of us are committed to loving you and to living out your love in our life. And I'll just pray for relationships specifically, Lord, those deep friendships, that feel us love that we all need to get through life. I'll just pray, Lord, that you illuminate people in our life, that you either put someone on our heart to go and have a coffee with or to call them, to reach out to them, to spend some time with. I just pray that you put that on our hearts, Lord. And for those who are feeling lost and are feeling alone and feeling like they don't have that person that they can rely on, Lord, I just pray that you bring someone into their life. In the name of Jesus, we just pray that philos love and agape love win out over everything else. That we trust, that we have faith, that it is a faith practice to trust you, that this is what you want for us. I just pray, Lord, that you make those opportunities real. And we just thank you, Lord, that no matter what, that you... You are in control of everything. We just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.